This is the 19th in a series of lectures on differential geometry. In this lecture, we'll first define what it means to talk about a differential equation for maps between manifolds. And then, in terms of that description of differential equations, we'll do something a bit unusual. We'll try to f find a way to avoid satisfying differential equations. Most often when we encounter differential equations, our concern is to try to find a way to solve them, to find solutions. But here we're going to try to avoid solving them. And then we'll try to apply that to see if we can map manifolds immersively into Euclidean space. When we change variables in differential equations, um, uh, we are always thinking about uh, the chain rule. That's the main technique we use in coordinate expressions. So for example, if we have a function y is y of x, and we introduce a new x variable, which to avoid you using the letter x, I'll call something that looks like the letter x. So let's say x bar uh, is a new variable. Let's suppose we have a diffeomorphism between the old variable and the new variable. Uh, again, I'm only calling an x bar not to mean anything like complex conjugation or anything like that, but just because I'd like it to be a, a new x variable, and so it should have a similar letter to the letter x. Um, so uh, so then, uh, that's, so that's why I call it x bar. Now, what we could do is to differentiate, and we recall that um, the chain rule says that if you want to calculate the derivative, let's call it y x bar, derivative of y with regard to the variable x bar, it's simply the derivative of y with regard to x times the derivative of x with regard to x bar. That's the chain rule. So now, um, what if we try to differentiate one more time? Because we're going to be interested in higher order derivatives. This already, we can see a lot of structure here. We see that the derivative at the corresponding x bar point is calculated from the derivative at the x point multiplied by this. Well, as we've seen, this turns out to be a matrix when we have m more derivatives. Um, so it's uh, multiplied by a change of variables matrix, um, a matrix of, of, of partial derivatives and when there are many functions of many variables. So. Uh, so this is some linear transformation that tells you that the derivative at the, uh, fun of the function of the old variable at a certain point uh, calculates out the one in the new variable at the corresponding point by multiplying by this thing here. So it's a linear transformation. If I differentiate one more time, I get a more complicated law. And of course, we don't want to keep differentiating because we'll, it'll get too horribly complicated. We get y x x, x x bar, x x bar um, plus y x uh, times x x bar x bar. So um, so a, a trivial calculation, but it gives us an, 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 a remarkable conclusion that um, you can calculate out the second derivative uh, in the new variables in terms of the second derivative in the old variables, but you also need to know the first derivative. So uh, So you can't just know the, just this value of the second derivative in, in the old variables and calculate the second derivative in the new variables. You have to also know at that same corresponding point what's the value of the first derivative. So the law becomes more complicated. It doesn't linearly transform second derivatives to, to second derivatives. It transforms them by some transformation that involves lower order terms. And if we kept going, if we calculated out the hundredth derivative, it would be calculated in the new variables in terms of the one of the old variables plus dot 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 lower order uh, derivatives going all the way down. So um, what I want to emphasize then is that it's possible to somehow calculate out such a chain rule, even if we had many functions of many variables and we wanted to calculate out derivatives in very high, uh, high order. Uh, we could calculate them in terms of derivatives of the same order in the old variables and lower order. Um, that's the main observation. Also, that there is some smooth way to do this, and it's kind of universal in the sense that if you want to think of it that you want to calculate for all functions all at once, um, they're new the derivatives in new variables in terms of the derivatives in old variables. You just have to plug in the derivatives in the old variables into this guy, and you get the derivatives in the new variables. Derivatives in the old variables here, giving derivatives in the new variables. And the coefficients that you use are the same coefficients for any function, any y of x function. You'd always use the same coefficients here, here, and here. These coefficient terms are, uh, are somehow universal, independent of the choice of the particular y function. So, um, so that gives us some idea of how we can, how we could carry this out if we wanted to, an arbitrary order of variables, which we won't really want to do. Let's try to make an abstract theory of derivatives and changes of variables. Um, 
So if we have, uh, let's suppose we have P and Q are manifolds, and uh, if we pick a point, P naught in P, um, and if we have maps, let's say F takes some open set in P to Q, and G takes an open set in P to Q, so these are maps of manifolds, um, and they're both defined. So this means n takes some open set, an unspecified, unnamed open set. So open subset of P here means some open subset. Open subset of, of P here means some possibly different open subset. Um, both defined near the point P naught in P. Then I want to uh, to say that they're equivalent. F is equivalent to G at order, uh, let's say, K at P naught if um, in some charts, um, so we have some, or let's say, maybe I should say coordinates, since we've become hopefully more comfortable with using the word coordinates instead of the word charts. So we take coordinate functions on P and coordinate functions on Q, um, then um, F becomes some uh, y equals f of x in the coordinates. Again, that's an abstract. We're using the same letter f for the abstract operation mapping abstract manifolds, and it's concrete expression in terms of a particular choice of charts on the manifolds or coordinates on the manifolds. Um, so f becomes this and g becomes this. It's not really, strictly speaking, correct to say what well, they become this, but rather that there is some way to write them in the, in, in the charts what they do what f does to a point whose coordinates are these x's is it moves it to a point whose coordinates are these y's. But it's so convenient to write it as y equals f of x, y equals g of x, that we can't resist the temptation. And then uh, I want to say that they're equivalent. Sorry, I'm still defining what does it mean to be equivalent of order k. It means they, um, they're equivalent of order, order k if they have the same, uh, have the same uh, Taylor series expansion. If in some in so in some coordinates dot 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 uh, f uh, y equals f of x equals um, dot 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 y equals g of x equals dot 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 the same uh, order k Taylor series. So the Taylor series up to uh, including terms of order k have to match up. So that's what I'll, uh, what I'll say there. They're equivalent. And it's not hard to convince yourself. This is really independent of the choice of the charts or coordinates that I took. If I change the, the coordinates on P to some others, coordinates on Q to some others, then Taylor series will change. The, every term will change, but it'll change by a recipe, which looks a little bit like the one that we just wrote down for how to take derivatives in old variables, derivatives in new variables. You know that every coefficient in the Taylor series is just some order of derivatives of this function here, and then similar to here. So uh, when we change variables in the y's and the x's to some other coordinates on p, some other coordinates on q, we'll have some transition maps that will uh, carry these Taylor coefficients uh, to some new Taylor coefficients. But it'll be the same, um, exactly the same, uh, the same uh, functions that, that appear um, because, as we said before, we have universal formulas. We can plug in any any f and g expansions in the red here, and they always use have the same coefficients in the blue here. And that means that if you if you calculate out for f using this kind of formula and for g using this kind of formula and so on for higher derivatives, um, you should get uh, that they they are transformed by exactly the same sort of formulas. And as a consequence, if they agree in the say the x variables, then they'll agree in the x bar variables and so on. And of course, that uh, would also have to be would have to check that that works if you change not only the x variables, which we did here, but also if you change the y variables, which is not very difficult to convince yourself of. So I won't do all, any details of that to to prove that this is actually well defined. Equivalence of order k means that in charts they have the same Taylor series to order k. But of course, that's a Taylor series, I should say, uh, calculated about the particular, in, in charts are where they calculated about the, um, we should make that more explicit, um, about the uh, point uh, x equals, let's say, x naught corresponding uh, to um, 
corresponding to p equals p naught in the manifold p. So we have to carry out the Taylor series expansion about a particular point, the point corresponding to wherever we're working. We're saying that they're equivalent to order k at this abstract point in the abstract manifold, in the abstract manifold, and um, we're saying we, we calculate out what that point gets mapped to in our coordinates, and then we calculate a Taylor series around that. Um, so uh, the equivalence classes are referred to as jets, and I'll use a notation. Maybe it's not a very wise notation, but um, I'll write the let's say F K at P naught is the equivalence class of F at order K at the point P naught. Um, so uh, so it's not a great notation, maybe because it suggests it's the kth derivative. Really, it contains all the information of all derivatives up to order k, because we calculated the entire Taylor series. So even though I'm put, making the notation look a little bit like kth derivative, it really means more than kth derivative. It really contains in charts all the derivatives of order 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to k of all the outputs y of all the inputs x. Uh, with regard to all the input uh, variables x, so uh, so it's it's a bit more information than that. Nevertheless, it's a convenient notation, so we'll use this for the moment. A more common notation might be something like uh, some people write something like this for the jet k jet, and it's called the called the k jet, or there's another notation for it, and it's called so f k uh, p not equals the k jet of f at point p naught. So it represents the Taylor series of, of an abstract map of manifolds, a Taylor series as computed in some choice of, of charts or coordinates, but if you change the charts, you, cha you change it equi by equivalence, you, you change it to the same, it represents the same equivalence class. So it doesn't really depend on the choice of the charts we use. The um, Jet bundle, which I have notation something like this, J, K, P, Q, is the set of all uh, jets. Uh, sorry, I put my I'm getting confused in my notation. Okay, so jets, K jets at P naught, such that F takes some open subset of P to Q, and P naught is in P lying in that open subset. Um, it's a set of all the jets. Uh, so f jets of all of all mappings, and they don't have to be defined globally. They're all lo only locally defined mappings. That's fine. We don't need globally defined mappings. Now, if we do check these charts, then um, in principle we can write jets in charts uh, or in coordinates. As we said, we could write our map f takes some open set in p to q. Uh, we could write it in in terms of coordinates. Again, the coordinates are the x's on here and the y's on here. We can write this y as f of x for some uh, f, and we also call it f, even though it isn't literally the same f. Um, it's so, as again, it's so convenient to call the expression of the function in some coordinates by the same name. Um, so how do we expand it? Well, we have to expand it out as a as a Taylor series. So um, now at this point, we're, we're, the notation gets a little bit unpleasant. Um, so the tradition is to... Um, is to use uh, x, the letter x, for the point, for the, well, the coordinates of the point p naught. If we want, so we have this guy, we want to we talk about its jet, we want to talk about its derivatives at a point p naught. We want to talk about all k derivatives. And again, this doesn't just mean the kth derivative, but all the derivatives up to order k. This is maybe not great notation, but that's what we're going to use. Um, so the tradition is to use the letter x for the coordinates of the point p naught. But now I ha need another variable. Uh, this is one of the most frustrating aspects of explaining this stuff. It's really not very difficult stuff, but we need a new variable or a new set of variables. We need, var let's say, variables um, to uh, expand in the Taylor series. And if we've already used the letter x for the uh, center of the Taylor series, we're doing some kind of Taylor expansion about some point, and the point is called little x, what are we going to use as the names of the variables that we're expanding in? So um, to um, come up with some kind of name that looks like the letter x, I decided to go with capital X. So we'll write, we'll expand out 
um, y equals f of capital X, where capital X are the names of variables which are supposed to represent the same variables as little x, except I'm going to always use little x to represent the point p naught I want to work at. So little x will be the point I'm going to ex tailor expand around. Uh, it has some coordinates, little x, of course, little x1 to little x something or other p, um, some uh, variables representing the point, but I have to be able to move that point. So f is going to have it's jet at a point p naught, but we're going to be moving that point p naught around, uh, so we need to have a name for it that doesn't look too fixed. And so I'll call that x. That little x is going to be the point p naught. So we have an abstract manifold p, and we have a point on it which is p naught, and we have a chart which is carrying this guy over to here, and it's going to carry that point p naught over to this point, little x. But then I need variables for this chart domain, and so I call them capital X's. So we're expanding this guy in this Taylor series um, as uh, some Taylor series polynomial of x minus little x expanded around the point little x plus higher order terms. These are the higher order terms. So this f then is a polynomial of degree at most uh, k, because we're looking at the kth derivatives, so k jet of this object. And so this is going to give me, uh, give rise to coordinates on the jet bundle. Um, so what do I mean by that? I mean this, this object here, the set of all, set of all k jets of maps from open set of p to, to q, um, that set of all k-jets is going to be a manifold. How do we make it a manifold? What we do is we associate to each jet of order k at each point, we associate this expression, little x, the point, which is the coordinate of coordinates of the point p naught, so we can remember what point we were working at, what point p naught we're actually going to work at. Um, that's going to be this this guy here, and then we have to conclude the polynomial, which we've written as capital F of X, um, defined by um, by Y equals capital F of capital X. So these are abstract variables, capital X's, and this is the point we're expand, Taylor expanding about. Um, okay, like this. Okay, so this is supposed to be um, how we compute this thing in, 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 in coordinates. So if I have coordinates, again, if I have coordinates x1 to xp on p, on capital P, and I have y1 to yq uh, on q, then I can write every map, little f from here to here, every map from this to this, as some uh, little f of x, little f of capital X, and expand it out around the point little x in a Taylor series expansion. So that's how I'll write it. So this, uh, when I take this jet, uh, this abstract jet between manifolds, an equivalence class of maps, I map it to the point x, which represents the uh, coordinates of where I'm of the of the center of the Taylor series expansion p naught, and then represent the polynomials. This is a polynomial. So uh, maybe I should make clearer when I write this out. What I'm doing is I'm not calculating the value of this polynomial at some point called capital X. I'm thinking of capital X as abstract variables. So I'll write out this guy and the co and the coefficients of this polynomial. So I'm writing this out really. I write capital F of X. I mean I expand it out as a polynomial write down all of its coefficients. So we could, if we really wanted to make a messy notation, actually write out some notation for all those coefficients that are that should be in here. But I'm just going to think of that as an abstract polynomial, as a polynomial uh, with abstract variables x sitting in it, and think of its coefficients as being the numbers here. So we map a jet, and this is in this abstract so-called jet space or jet bundle. We map the jet in the jet space, we map it to this point, which is in some R something or other, some enormous dimensional um, Euclidean space given by all the x variables and then all the coefficients of the polynomial. So, uh, so I'll write down a polynomial f of capital X, but I really mean I'm storing all of its coefficients in some enormous vector. And so I get this ve huge vector with all the x entries and all the coefficients of the polynomial. So that's how we'll construct a chart. This is my chart on uh, the uh, jet space or jet bundle.
So that's fairly abstract. Let's see if we can just do it in the simplest ex possible example um, so that we can see what does all that add up to. Uh, so if we work out as an, as an example, let's work out the one jet space of maps from R to R. Um, what does that look like? Um, so we'll have an R, a real line with a parameter X, and then yeah, that is our global chart, and a real line with a parameter Y, that's our other chart. And then this one jet space has to keep track of one derivative of information about such maps. So it has to have some coordinates, which are going to be x's, y's, and some, let's say, y sub x's that represent derivative information. And um, if I were to, uh, to um, write out uh, in the notation I was just using, uh, what was this x, f of x nonsense? Um, what does that mean in this case? What you could do is you could say, well, if I take a function um, uh, f, so I take y equals f of x function, and I calculate its jet, uh, its jet, uh, jet meaning Taylor series in this situation, because we're actually on actual Euclidean space, so you can actually calculate jets by just calculating Taylor series in any coordinates. And so if you have the real number line with coordinate x, real number with coordinate y, you can use those coordinates. So you just calculate its Taylor series, and its Taylor series is, after all, y equals um, uh, some uh, 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 f of x minus x uh, Taylor series expansion um, uh, expanded around around this point. Um, so I'd expand it in a, in a, in a Taylor series. Um, so we write out this general Taylor series as f of x minus x. Um, has to equal some y value uh, plus it has to be um, some uh, uh, derivative value times x minus x. So that's that's it expanded about this point. So it has a y uh, constant value, uh, and then as far as this particular function we're expanding for this particular function, it's going to have a, a a y value and a derivative value about the point x. And so calculate it at that point. So we expanded it there. And so we can say that f of x for us just means the, the y value of the function at, at the given x value plus the derivative at that point times an abstract variable x. Okay, it's not very exciting. Um, all we're saying really is that you can calculate derivatives in terms of Taylor series. The Taylor series in terms of derivatives. The constant term in the Taylor series is the y the constant value, the initial value of y where you start, and then this guy measures how you move from there. So it's not very, uh, very serious. It's just standard Taylor series, but we needed a notation for it. So in the, in this notation, we could say that our coordinates are x's and uh, x and then linear polynomial. Um, but we could also say that, um, or in other words, uh, if you write that out, that's x and then y plus y x capital X. But that polynomial has a constant term and a, and, and a linear term, so it's good enough to just write it as x equals isn't really equal, but it's also representable by knowing the constant term and the and the slope of the linear function. So in other words, uh, one description of this jet space is, is the one we've just given at the beginning, which is that it's, uh, we, we can keep track of where we are in this jet space by asking what, what point x we're at in the real number line, what's our value of y in the output variables, and then what's the derivative of y as a function of x. Um, so that's what this jet thing keeps track of. And so it gives us, it's a three-dimensional manifold. Now suppose we were to change coordinates. Um, if we change coordinates from our given variables to some new variables by some change of variables, so again we'll write them as x bar is x bar of x, y bar is y bar of y, and um, then uh, we're going to get a, um, a change of variables formula, which we already wrote down, which is simply that, well, more or less we wrote down y bar x bar has to, of course, be uh, uh, dy bar uh, dy, yx, dx, dx bar, where these differential operations really are derivatives. I'm actually taking derivatives of these functions. So I make new variables. My first copy of the real number line. Remember, we're working on we're working on the real number line with variable x, and the real number line as the input space, the output space for our maps is is some 
variables y. So this is our p manifold. Uh, this is our p manifold. This is our q manifold. Um, and uh, so we're mapping from this one to this one. And the jets of maps from p to q consist of choices of some value for x, some value for y, and some value for yx. Uh, sorry, x, y, and yx. Parameterize the choices of the of the one jets. But if you change variables like this, you change the x variables to new x variables, the y's to new y's, then you have to change the derivative variables to new derivative variables by the change of variables formula from one variable calculus, but where these are actually calculated using derivatives, and that's just an abstract variable. So what I can th imagine is forget that this had anything to do with jets. Forget about that entirely, and just imagine that I have a manifold which has coordinates which are very bizarrely named x, y, and y sub x. But when you have your uh, coordinates, they're given by variables called, you have coordinates given by x bar, y bar, and y bar sub x bar. So I have three abstract variables on my manifold. You have three abstract variables on the same vari manifold, the same. You have, I have these coordinates, you have these coordinates. And we pass from one to the other by a transition map. And the transition map is given supposedly by exactly this formula here. That's OK. You could always have such a thing. I mean, you could always imagine you have a three-dimensional manifold with such coordinates on it and these as the transition maps. But if you had that, then it would have the weird property that it would take um, jets that of maps from y as a function of x to jets of mass of y, uh, y bar as a function of x bar. And so it would represent somehow uh, a one-jet manifold. So this is the language we'll use. It's really just a question of having a terminology, a, a geometric description of what it means to talk about Taylor series expansions. Um, so from uh, Taylor series computed in charts for maps between abstract manifolds. So this is the collection of all jets of all maps from open sets of P to Q. They don't have to be globally defined maps on P because we only have to calculate Taylor series expansions. So we only need them to be defined near some point where we calculate out a series expansion in some chart. Now we want to start using this concept to think about differential equations and how we solve or avoid solving them. Um, so first thing I want to think about is the so-called strong topology. Um, uh, it given an open set in jets, uh, JPEG PQ open, um, uh, we can consider the, the strong um, open set, uh, which I'm going to call something like U prime, is defined to be the set of all all uh, smooth maps uh, F, so that the uh, K jet of F uh, belongs to, well, let's say at each point P, belongs, each point P belongs to U for all P. Where, yeah. Well, sorry, for, sorry for all for all p and p. Okay, so um, so it's the set of all of all smooth maps that behave according to this constraint. So we can think of this as a constraint on possible k derivatives of a map, and u prime will be the maps that satisfy that constraint. So this isn't a differential equation so much as some kind of differential inequality. It constrains certain derivatives to be held in, in uh, some control over them in k derivatives, and these are the maps that satisfy that. Um, so a strong topology, uh, a strong topology on smooth maps uh, from some manifold P to some manifold Q is the topology generated by all of these u primes. This is, these are collections of smooth maps. So this is a constraint on but smooth maps could satisfy, and this is the set of maps that satisfy it. In, in order to make this more concrete, we need to examine these, um, these, uh, these kinds of, of, this kind of topology in some kind of uh, coordinate chart description. So, um, so let's suppose we, we look for, first of all, we'll look for a locally finite atlas, a locally finite atlas means um, means a, an atlas so that um, uh, so that uh, so it's um, charts some charts ui phi i with um, each point uh, in only finitely many of the uis and every manifold has one of these we don't have time for uh, to prove 
that there are such things. We'll just uh, take that as, as a given. It's proven in the notes. So we take a smooth map. Um, uh, so let's start with a smooth map. Let's say F naught takes P to Q. We'll always need some kind of smooth map to get things seeded to get started on this uh, this story. Um, and uh, then what we're going to do is um, is to try to, to to describe which maps are close to it in the in the strong topology, a strong neighborhood of F naught is um, well. Uh, associated to, so a, we'll say what a strong neighborhood is, it's associated to, um, we need a bunch of data, um, uh, a locally finite atlas uh, so some locally finite atlas of charts, some UI, VI um, that's the first thing we'll need, then we'll need um, a compact set uh, well, we need compact sets Ki contained in each Ui on which we're going to constrain things, and they could be empty. Uh, that's fine too. Some of them could be empty, all of them could be empty. Um, uh, charts on on uh, Q, we don't need them to be um, locally finite, but with, um, let's say, so Wi Ci with uh, our ma given map, the seed map that we start with, this F naught, should take these compact sets into these open sets. Um, we need some numbers, epsilon i greater than zero, which we think of as error tolerances. That's why we write them as epsilon. They're to to tolerance for allowing some amount of error away from from the given map F naught. And then finally, we need some uh, uh, integers. L i, um, all uh, bounded by some some fixed L, uh, all bounded from above by some fixed L, integer L. Um, so that the point is to say then that we want to consider maps which satisfy some kind of estimate. We're given a particular map F naught, and we want to find all the maps that are somehow not too far away from it, um, in some sense, uh, and they should be. Um, uh, so the the strong neighborhood, the strong neighborhood uh, associated to that data, to all that information, is the set of maps F such that um, uh, that F uh, of every one of the compact sets sits inside the neighborhood of a chart, so we can calculate in that chart, and in those charts. Well, in those coordinates of those charts, of all the charts we've, we've described, um, uh, F has um, all derivatives of order uh, Li within uh, epsilon I of those of the given sort of seed F naught. We wanted to make it something close to F naught, and so what we're going to do is we're going to constrain our maps to have the property that they locally, on some little, little compact sets, they stay inside our coordinates so that the coordinates are defined on them, and in those coordinates they're close to the map. F is close to um, the map F naught that we're given, close in the sense of having the derivatives of the given order within the given error estimate. So this captures the notion that simultaneously we're allowing ourselves to constrain on a, a sequence of compact sets that go off uh, far away in our manifold. So not just one compact set, but a whole sequence of them that might cover the entire manifold. And on each of those, we have some kind of estimate that we're demanding that F should satisfy. Um, so it's not obvious that there really will be any F other than F naught that can possibly satisfy all those estimates. 
but that's the strong neighborhood we're going to we're going to ask for. Uh, put up infinitely many estimates going further and further and further out in the manifold, each in a compact set of the manifold. But you get to pick infinitely many of those compact sets, a sequence of them going off perhaps to infinity. And each of them you have uh, some constraints on some derivatives. Uh, but the bounds of der how or how many derivatives you get to constrain are they're all bounded by a single integer l. So there is one constraint of how far you can go. Now, well, the reason we introduce these strong neighborhoods, these are just basically local estimates on, on functions, is the um, following result, which is almost obvious, the, the strong topology, um, which we said was generated by, by all of these u primes for all the u's open subsets of all the jets of all orders. Um, it, that is the same it is uh, the topology generated by the strong uh, neighborhoods that we just described in coordinates. And the proof is, is, is essentially trivial. Each strong neighborhood constrains a map uh, by making its derivatives of some order be close to some given, the derivatives of some given map. Um, uh, and, and so that makes an open set of jets that you're allowed to use for such maps. You're allowed to use the ones that satisfy that estimate. Um, and that's therefore this open set. Uh, on the other hand, if we have some open set in here, we can make an even smaller open set. So local description of these of these jets, as we said, is, is just as Taylor series. And we can make an even tighter constraint on the Taylor series, which would arise by uh, constraining them in coordinates to be very close to a given uh, given function. So if this, uh, we have some non-empty set, u prime, it has some function f naught in it, you pick a really tight constraint on derivatives of order k that makes functions uh, with, that satisfy that constraint be within that strong neighborhood, uh, um, within that open set, uh, having their jets in that open set, and that'll give you a strong neighborhood. So the strong topology is generated by the strong neighborhoods basically because it's estimates on derivatives of a given order. Now, um, we want to make a, a very surprising uh, result here. So this is not so surprising. Estimates on derivatives expressed in coordinates are the same as estimates on derivatives expressed not in coordinates, is more or less what this says, uh, open estimates. But um, uh, we want to make a rather surprising statement. Uh, this is the following theorem, the smooth maps, perhaps. Um, uh, between manifolds, and if we're given two manifolds, say P and Q, smooth maps between those manifolds form a bare space. I'll say what that means in a second. Um, a bare space in the strong topology. So if you can control derivatives of a given order up to some order L on far away compact sets going all over your manifold, uh, you get some kind of strong topology. That, those kind of control gives you a strong topology. And then the smooth maps uh, form a bare space. Now what's a bare space? Uh, so the smooth maps are now a topological space in the strong topology. What's, what, when's a topological space a bare space? Um, so this is a, a topological statement, a topological space. X is a bare space if um, every uh, intersection, say um, uh, u1 intersect u2 intersect dot dot dot, contained in uh, well, of, of open sets, let's just say of open sets, uh, not just open, sorry, of dense open sets u1, u2, dot, 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 contained in x, uh, is dense. Maybe not open, but it's dense. Um, so that's a, a fundamental property. And our favorite example uh, is probably Euclidean space. Let's just say even just the real number line is bare for the usual Euclidean topology. If you take a, an, a dense open set in the real number line, and then another one, and another one, another one, you intersect them all, you still have a dense set. It may not be open, in general will be open, but it'll still be dense. 
Um, okay, so we want to prove this property for the smooth maps. Now this topology we introduced is not a metric topology. The strong topology is not a metric topology. So it's, it's, a, very, it's a very serious example because most of the bare spaces we encounter are, are, are metric spaces, and complete metric spaces are always bare. It's one of the big theorems in, in um, metric space theory. But this isn't an, such an example. This is a rather serious example of something that is bare, and it's quite important that it is a bare space, but that isn't... Um, uh, arising from a metric space. Okay, so how do we prove that it's bare? We have to take an infinite sequence of dense open sets. Um, so we take an infinite sequence of uh, dense open sets and we're interested in their intersection. So what we have to do, so these are all dense open sets inside the set of all uh, uh, smooth maps in the strong topology. So uh, what we need to do is to prove that this is dense. Let's call this A is this intersection. We need to show that A is dense. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to pick um, a smooth map. F not. Okay, one of the smooth maps. Um, and we're not asking that it be in A. Um, we want to show, well, we need, on, we need only show that... Um, to show that, that something's dense, we need to show that F0 is in the closure. The closure is everything, so it's dense. Um, so in other words, we need to show exactly that. Um, uh, that's exactly saying that every strong uh, neighborhood of F0 strikes um, uh, A. So that it, it, all the open sets around all the well, the generators of the open sets around F not actually hit this guy. So uh, so if we take a strong neighborhood neighborhood uh, W, let's call it W one prime, um, from some each each strong neighborhood we said was associated to um, some. Uh, uh, for some uh, open set uh, W in uh, some K jet, say K1 of maps. So we take some strong neighborhood and we need to show uh, O of, of F0. So something near uh, F0, maps that are close to F0 in some, uh, in some estimate on some jets. So what we need to show uh, is that uh, W1 in prime intersects A. Now, we don't know that that's true, but we do know that U1 is dense and open by definition. Well, we don't really know it's open, we just know that it's dense. Um, so uh, W1 prime has to intersect uh, U1. It's not empty. So we can pick some, um, some uh, F, uh, uh, F1 in uh, W1 prime intersect U1. And now what I'm going to do is um, pick a strong neighborhood W2 prime um, with, uh, 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 well, with, um, uh, what do I need? Uh, so, we're going to pick a strong neighborhood W2 prime, uh, oh, contained in it, right, sorry, um, contained in. So we can make a smaller open set. Because these, these strong neighborhoods actually generate the topology, you can, you can find them inside everywhere, inside every open set around anything. You can always find another one. And so you can do this. You make a strong neighborhood here, and then um, we pick some, uh, inductively, we pick some W3 prime contained in W two prime intersect. Sorry, that wasn't U one, and this is intersect uh, U two, and so on. So we're getting these shrinking, shrinking sets. They're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So what we need to do precisely is to show. We need to pick uh, these. We haven't really picked them. We said that there are such. We need to pick these W one, W two, and so on inside various jet spaces of various orders, so that. Um, these uh, these things have a non-zero intersection, so there's some uh, f is in w j prime for all j in all of them, 
and then we'll be done. Um, because each of these is nested inside the previous one, so then it'll be inside all of these U's, and so it'll be inside their intersection. Now, by definition of strong neighborhoods, each strong neighborhood is not empty. So we know we have each WI prime is not empty. Um, so it has something in it. Um, and what we're going to do is simply to require that, uh, that each WI uh, is going to be a constraint on jets of very, very high order. So what we do is we, um, we make some uh, pick uh, WI um, so that uh, it involves much higher order derivatives. So it involves some KI PQ and it be much higher order derivatives at each step. So K1 less than K2 less than da da da. In other words, at every single step as I go along the story, I'm going to constrain more and more and more derivatives of the functions that I'm looking for. I'm looking for some functions in, in, in all of these sets, and I'm going to constrain them by requiring that, that they constrain more and more and more tightly as we go on. And we're going to constrain them in the following way. We're going to require that um, the wi, well, wi is after all sitting inside ki I jets, maps from p to q, and um, wi minus one is sitting inside a much lower number of jets. It has no less, fewer derivatives that it constrains, and so there's an obvious map from higher numbers of derivatives that you keep track of to lower numbers. If I have the jet that keeps track of ki derivatives of a function of a map between these two, then I can forget all but the first k mi ki minus one derivatives, a lower number of derivatives. And so I have a map from this guy to this guy, and can we can make um, we can make wi so small that uh, not only wi but even wi bar lies inside uh, wi minus 1 when you forget uh, that order of derivatives. In fact, uh, we get to pick the inequalities that we pick on ki derivatives. Once we found, we found we've got some derivatives here, we've got some function that satisfies this, this estimate, we can pick this estimate as tight as we like, in particular around any function we already had from the previous, that satisfied the previous es estimate. So we can make these, these get tighter and tighter. We can make uh, each wi constrain uh, all derivatives uh, of a given order. Let's say, you know, the first derivatives, for example. It gets to constrain all derivatives up to order ki. In particular, it could constrain all derivatives of order of, say, say order 1 um, by uh, some uh, Cauchy sequence uh, in some, in uh, coordinates. So, in other words, you make the make it get tighter and tighter and tighter so fast that um, that it, it it's going to converge. And so, um, and because we made sure that these closures actually are contained inside the next guys, it's really the closures we're going to be able to look at. We'll make sure that we have estimates that are getting tighter and tighter, and they're closed estimates, we're making some Cauchy sequence on the functions uh, of a given order on of the derivatives of functions of a given order. That'll force that, them to converge, so we get convergence. Uh, we get convergence of all derivatives, because if for any particular derivative, um, if you go high up enough, you're eventually constraining. Where are we? Eventually, we're constraining this wi involves ki constrains ki derivatives, and we're making that go to infinity. So if you wait long enough, eventually you hit constraints on over on eight thousand derivatives, if that's what you want, and the constraints get tighter and tighter at each step, so that they rapidly converge in a Cauchy sequence to force you down to a particular function, which uh, which you can ensure lies in all of them uh, all the way through as you go through the through the story. So you get a limit. Um, and the limit's actually smooth because you can have a convergence of all derivatives. And so you actually get a, a smooth uh, function, which is inside all of the all all of these UIs because we nested the WIs to be inside the UIs. Okay, so that's the proof that it's a bare space. So it's it's a traditional terminology um, it seems a bit strange, it's a bit like we might encounter in measure theory, to say the generic uh, map, uh, from a smooth map from P to Q, uh, has some, and you put some property 
property, um, right, some property, uh, or is such and such. Um, what we mean by that is that uh, the set of maps uh, from PDQ with that property, smooth maps, of course they're only interested in smooth maps, with that property is a uh, is uh, an intersection, a countable intersection so u1 intersect, u2 intersect, da, 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 of dense open sets and therefore, dan therefore dense by our previous result. We're not just saying that it's dense, we're saying uh, even more than that, that it actually arises somehow this way as the intersection of some u1, some u2, and so on, each of which is dense open. So that's what we mean when we say the generic map has some property, when we say the generic map is you know something or other. Um, uh, it doesn't have some horrible kind of singularity or something like that. We mean the set of maps with that property is such a countable intersection. Um, somehow for some choice of some open sets. And that's a convenient terminology to use. It gives us the idea that we're talking about all the maps except for some weird exceptions that are basically ignorable, or at least that the, the collection we're talking about is very, is very large because it's dense. We're talking about a property that's, that's fairly common, it's not rare. So our, our goal is really to show um, is to show something like for various PDEs, for various differential equations, um, given some sort of differential equation, we want to say the generic um, map doesn't satisfy. Or even something stronger than that, the generic map uh, refuses to satisfy in some sort of strong way that it it forces itself out of the di the, the the differential equation solution space in some sort of strong non-degenerate manner. So that's what we'll try to complete next time. Um, now this lecture is getting to be a bit long. We'll move on next time to thinking about why it is that we can actually use this notion of being bare um, to show that maps uh, can be made to avoid satisfying various sorts of equations.